thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I've got about um, uh, 26 slides, which means that I need to take about 40 seconds per slide uh, as we go. So I'm going to skate across the top of this and uh, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you have. These are our 13 tips on how to successfully run a small group coaching. Um, why, why focus on small group coaching now? Well, um, the, I suppose the number one reason is it can be delivered virtually and very effectively virtually, which is kind of helpful. But even as we're coming out of um, lockdown, I think um, most of the people on the call know that, um, you know, putting proposals forward to senior leaders for very large um, leader, new leadership programs is going to be very difficult in the next um, six to nine months. But at the same time, there's lots of leaders who need lots of help. In fact, you could argue that. Um, leadership right now is as, as, as important as it's ever been in terms of helping people get back to work, dealing with some of the mental issues that are going to be um, uh, out there post um, lockdown. So um, it's a very good time maybe to just talk, to talk through how this might work if you were to do it internally. Um, uh, it does get better results. Um, so we do obviously typical workshops, but we also do small group coaching and the small group coaching gets a higher MP NPS score uh, by some distance than any of the face-to-face uh, -face sort of one or two day workshops that we do. Um, uh, it's very flexible as far as the modern, modern workplace is concerned, but and as we'll, we'll talk through that. It is a bit of a paradigm shift, I think, for um, some of the clients that we work with, and particularly L&D. In L&D and OD, you're kind, of, you're kind of in a space where you're in control of what people learn. Small group coaching actually flips that. It means it's much more participant-led because it's a coaching uh, execution. So most of the coaches and several of them are on the, on the call um, uh, today will tell you that, um, you know, really the participants can drive where the conversation goes. And that's really where it becomes very applied and, and very individually tailored. So, um, uh, and it's affordable and most importantly, it's fun as well. So um, all sorts of reasons why you should do it. What's our definition? Um, well, they're small groups. So typically two, three, four people. We think five is too many. Uh, you can talk about that if you want. Episodic, it means it happens, um, you know, they're two hour sessions or two and a half hour sessions, once every fortnight or once every month. Um, curriculum based, so when we talk about a leadership program, that's small group coaching, curriculum based, um, this is not the coaching circles that, you know, happen in between the workshops. This is where the coaching circles, in effect, have become the program. Um, so we have 14 topics, for example, in, our, in ours, you can have any, any number of topics you want. Um, and um, uh, the participants choose which sort of six or seven or eight topics they're going to do. You clearly you can do it virtual face to face, um, various session cycles. Um, it, when, when I talk about the flexibility last year, we did a pod for one of our clients, one pod for three people. And for another one of our clients, we did 38 pods for 150 liters. So it's quite, it's much more scalable than you might imagine it is if you get the settings right. Um, and it's, it really is a sort of just in time type approach. Um, so it gives you lots of flexibility, particularly in uncertain times like this. Um, why should you listen to us? We've been doing it for seven years. We've made all the mistakes, trust me. Um, lots of lessons, thousand graduates. Most of those are frontline. Uh, but now we've added middle managers and sales managers and experts to the sort of fast lead things. But it, really, you, it gives you a good example of how you really can customize to a particular group using the same um, infrastructure in terms of the uh, learning system. So what we're going to do today is to share with you our biggest lessons. And I'm going to do that in about 30 seconds per lesson um, and, um, and, then, and then see what else you want to know about. Um, uh, here are the 13 tips. On the right-hand side there you see... Um, uh, a paper which is going to be available to you, which goes into all of these 13 rules in a great more detail um, uh, if, you, uh, if you're interested beyond this um, webinar. All right, let's get going. Number one, leverage the strategic opportunity. So um, once you have your infrastructure in place, it's, it's possible to launch programs for small or even reasonably large cohorts very quickly with this type of infrastructure. Obviously reduces travel and accommodation, um, there are many ways to leverage it and, and it is really flexible. So you're not building a program, you're building an infrastructure that enables you to do all sorts of different things for all sorts of different people just in time. So um, once you put the work in to build your infrastructure, it really does give you um, a strategic you know, opportunity. 
Number, number two, approach your design differently. So um, different curriculums for every pod are possible, for example. Participants choose their own learning path. This is something that um, the participants tell us they absolutely adore, that they're kind of in control of their own learning. Something, if you think about it, we've been saying that they should be for a while, but we quite often don't give them that control around their own learning path. So um, many of our clients um, choose to nominate three or four topics that will be mandatory that everybody needs to do. And then they let the pod, the people in the pod des uh, decide on the, another two or three topics. So, um, you know, from that perspective, it's um, very flexible. You can match the coach to the participants because you're dealing with small groups. So, you know, someone who's, if it's a very commercial group, for example, you can choose a very commercial coach. You know, if it's uh, much more strategic, then it's the same again. Um, there's a variety of assessments that you can put in and, and it can, as I say, be deployed um, with it. We, we constantly, as learning development and OD teams, telling our leaders that they, they need to be flexible and agile. Um, this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are too. How good is that? Um, make tactical decisions early. So you've got quite a few tactical decisions that you need to make when you're designing these programs. And I would really encourage you to spend some time thinking about what these are and, and how they might work. Because the trick here is once you build an infrastructure, that you must be inflexible around that infrastructure. You can be flexible about a lot of other things, but you can't be flexible about the infrastructure. So how many participants per pod? You know, typically, we think three is the magic number. A number of our clients use four for various reasons, and that seems to work really well as well. Two is really hard on the coach. And, um, and five, we think, is too many because the sessions go too long. Remember that in each session here, we want the participant to be able to be coached by the coach one-on-one -on -one while the other two participants are watching. And so to give people the right amount of airtime, um, and you don't want the session to go too long, so two hours, three people, one coach, seems to be the, the area where it, it works really well. How many sessions per cycle? We use six or eight um, Locations, you know, are you going to have a single location or are you going to do you going to do it face to face or virtual? Um, we say in the paper the biggest mistake we've made is to agree when there's been three leaders and they've all worked in different parts of the city, it's Melbourne or Sydney or, or um, you know, Wellington or Auckland, and um, we've allowed them to circulate around um, the locations each time. It's an, it's an absolute nightmare. Don't do it to yourself. Frequency of sessions. Um, you know, fortnightly, monthly, and then topic selection. Are you going to let people choose them or not? There are some subsidiary ones. What levels of leaders are you going to use? Um, my team will tell you that I've been pushing back on middle managers being in coaching sessions for a long time, but we've now um, um, produced a, a program that does that called Fast Lead Plus, and, and guess what? It's working really well. So I was wrong. Um, sorry, Kirsty. Um, uh, who does the actual coaching? We'll go into some detail on that in a minute. You've, you've got external options. So you can build the program internally, but use external coaches, or you can build the program internally and use internal coaches. And that's a really key decision. Um, and then how are you going to measure it? And the beauty about um, small group coaching is that you really, really can measure it. Um, you can measure all sorts of things. Okay, number four. <clears throat> this is teaching you all to suck eggs. But I just make this point. Everyone knows this is true that if you get the wrong people for the wrong reasons with the wrong mindset on the program, the program tends to be a train crash. And of course, the people who really put the wrong people on the program, which is the managers, um, never get the blame. Although you could argue that actually it's our fault for not being robust enough and insisting on um, a really good nomination process. The reason this is a really key thing as far as small group coaching is concerned is that if you've got a, a cohort of 15 participants, um, there, and one of them is a bad egg, is there for the wrong reason, then your facilitator is dealing with, you know, with this one fifteenth of a problem, really. Um, and that's still painful. We've all been in the room dealing with someone who really doesn't want to be there. It's got really crossed arms and it's just a pain in the rear end. But if you do, if you make the mistake of getting the wrong person in a pod with three people, suddenly it's 33% of the problem. And um, all of the coaches on, on this call will tell you that is a real nightmare territory. So the best way to resolve that, and, and, and it's really difficult to manage and restructure and what have you. So the best way to do that is to make sure that we over communicate the importance of nomination and we get the right people on the program. Um, Project management should be a forethought, not an afterthought. Um, this is a little graphic here of, you know, what happens with one pod session. So 
Um, you can see all these things. Obviously, the date and time needs to occur. And you have to remind the participants, you know, we remind them once, they're adults, just once, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have to remind the coach occasionally, we have to remind the coach twice. Um, uh, they're, they're brilliant in the pod session, but occasionally they're a bit disorganized. Sorry, coaches. Um, uh, Pre-work, um, we have to send them out post-work. Um, we send the manager out a toolkit after the pod session has happened, and then we have some reporting to do. So there's quite a lot of moving parts on one pod. Um, <clears throat> if you've got um, 15 people, um, uh, then you've got you know this this number of pods. Is that right? Three, six, maybe twelve. So you've got six sessions um, for one group of three, I should say. So these are all the things you have to organise. Um, and there's some stuff at the front and some stuff at the back. There's quite a lot of detail around how we design this and what this looks like on our website, by the way. <clears throat> but if you're doing a, a um, that's three people. If you're doing 15 people, that's how many things need to be organized and need to be measured and need to be tracked. So um, you can see that that is a lot of moving parts. Um, and as a consequence, you need um, to make sure you work out who is going to be doing this. You need some sort of a dedicated resource. It don't have to be full time by any means, but somebody needs to be across this. Um, the best way of doing it is strong project plan and processes that you stick to. Automate if you can. We've automated around Salesforce. Um, and Pardo, um, dedicated resource, pre-agreed reporting regime. You don't suddenly want to have to report on things that <clears throat> you're not set up for. I just made a comment here at the bottom, chargeback helps enormously. If, if you're charging the managers or the divisions for their participants' participation in the program, that tends to help with accountability uh, as well, I think. So um, I think I said I was going to stop after five grant and see if there were any questions. Yep, we've got one question from Martha who's asked, um, when you were talking about earlier about having pushed back on middle managers doing small group coaching, what was the concern? And, and this is the only question we have, so we'll go straight on from there. Okay, fantastic. So thanks, Martha. Um, my concern was that when, when frontline leaders come into a pod, um, and I'm sure this would be most of your experience as well, all, all they want to do is learn how to lead. It's their first leadership position. They're not really competitive with one another in any way. Um, they, you know, they, they're very, generally speaking, they're super keen. If you've, nom if you've got the right nominations through, they're super keen to learn everything and they work really well together. Most of our coaches will tell you, they just, they really gel. They, they, it's very easy to run the, uh, the pod. My concern was at, at most middle manager level is that those middle managers are quite often competitive with each other for the next promotion. Um, and also they don't, because of that, they don't necessarily like admitting what they don't know or what they're not doing properly. Um, and they, you know, they arrive with actually quite a lot of um, uh, baggage, if you like. So um, the design that we've done to get around that is we, we put them into scenarios and they have to, instead of telling us whether they're good at something, they have to demonstrate it through a scenario uh, piece and then we we pull the leadership content the curriculum piece out the back rather than the front that was that was my concern great question okay um hopefully that answered it prepare to be totally inflexible now i know this is gonna <clears throat> you're not going to you're not going to like this but the truth is that with small group coaching you can't afford to be flexible about some things there are things on the left hand side you can be there but on the right hand side the structure of the program um things like attendance you know if, you, if, they, if they want to move around the session with a month's notice because they're going on holiday or, you know, um, whatever the case may be, then that's fine. A month's notice is fine. But anything less than a month is, is a complete nightmare to organise because you've got a coach and you've got three participants to, to organise around a two-hour session. So our rule is, from an attendance perspective, um, is you use it or lose it. And it's really, and we make that very clear to the managers. Um, short notice, schedule change, not having that. Constant follow-ups required, no way. If, if they are the right nominated people, they should be very, very positive about turning up and learning. And pulling participants out because there's a crisis, you know, from my perspective, that's double no way. The number one reason that people get pulled out of um, pods is the managers. Um, and so we really work hard with the managers around uh, making sure that they realize that when they do that, they're, they're simply losing their money and they're very negatively impacting the um, the learning journey of the, their participants. Okay, plan, pod, chemistry carefully. Um, this is just to say, I'm sure it's so obvious, match participants carefully. You have a real ability to do this in a lot more detail. The, the tip at the bottom there is don't rush this part. You know, we ask 
our, our participants and our clients to give us a lot of information about the participants so we can really spend some time you know matching them there's some strategic opportunities in matching you know one of our large clients um, in Melbourne has used the silo busters and super effectively as well they've done a great job um, where they've got people from different divisions of their organization all working in the same pod and the feedback from the program was one of the things that people loved most was how much they learned about the rest of the organization and and uh, you know those those people over in project management weren't quite as stupid as we thought originally they were peas in a pod is where you take three people um you know from say uh, i don't know perth adelaide and sydney who do exactly the same job don't normally interface with one another but you can you can put them together and they share experiences and and so on and i'm sure you'll you'll think of um, some other ones managers make the difference um, so here's how we go through with the managers um, we do a pre-nomination briefing so they nominate the right people we do an induction briefing with them so that they are uh, clear on what their responsibilities are as well as the participants and we talk about not pulling them out at the last moment for example we do three-way check-ins which are really important um, you know we very often find that the manager is saying things to the participant that the participants never heard from the manager before and they're doing so because there's a coach sitting there I'm sure you've probably had that experience uh, and as irritating as that is that's really important um, every, after every session they get a manager toolkit you know if it's change you know, these are the concepts, you know, we talked about the change curve, we talked about, you know, Cotter's eight steps of change. These are the concepts. If you want, you can go to our learning portal and learn more about those so you don't, don't look like a goose in front of your participants. And also in those toolkits, we give them discussion guides. We survey them regularly and we do a three-way checkout. So um, as I say uh, above there, they can absolutely be a force for good, but as we know, they can be a force for evil as well. They make the difference. Um, some data we did earlier on um, a couple of years ago showed that the, the participant was three times more likely to have seriously deployed lots of new learning and leadership in the workplace if they had a supportive manager. And if they didn't have a supportive manager, then um, quite a lot of that learning was dissipated. So I'm sure everybody knows that, but this is a way of doing it. Okay, um, uh, next one is deploy the 10-25. So this is nothing to do with um, 70-20-10. But um, this is how you would spend time in the pod. 10% 10, 10 is, you know, feedback, how did you go? 25% is curriculum delivery, which is nevertheless done without PowerPoint and, um, you know, in a coaching style. And then 65% of the time is coaching, where there's one-to-one -one coaching and, and group coaching around those three. Um, the, the secret of success, in, in our view, is to make sure that coaching is 65%. Um, it's very easy to spend too long on the, on the curriculum delivery, um, but the, the piece that participants value most is that yellow chunk right there. So um, spend a lot of time with your coaches and, and what have you, making sure they understand what the right thing to do in their spaces. Okay, accredit coaches properly. Um, <clears throat> this is the most important number one success factor and the coaches that we have on the, the, um, on the call will be feeling very happy with themselves. Um, that I, I put this up, but it's true. The fact is that um, the, the person who really spends the time and creates the learning opportunity for the participants is the coach. And if you're doing small group coaching, you want actually a consistency across um, uh, all of those uh, coaching sessions. So um, it's very important um, that the proper accreditation is done. This is something that we got wrong um, when, we, when we first started um, doing this. So there's many uh, people and culture executives will do this very well internally, um, uh, but you need to accredit them. You need to set standards and they have to earn their status as a small group coach. You need to see them in action actually. Um, and um, it's, small group coaching is very different from one-to-one -one coaching. We've had one-to-one -one coaches who haven't made the grade in terms of small group coaching. And we've made, we certainly had facilitators who haven't made the grade because all they've wanted to do is, is to deliver content rather than coach. Um, biggest challenge with choosing internal coaches, which is surmountable, but it's a challenge, is that there has to be a really strong rule about confidentiality. Um, if, if any information from the pod that's delivered, say, by a coach who's an HR business partner or one of the L&D team, if it gets back to the manager or gets back into the, the, the system, if anything is discussed from that pod outside the pod by the internal PNC person, you, you're in trouble because immediately the trust is lost inside the pod and um, uh, 
um, uh, you're going you're to have difficulties. They, they just they won't be honest with one another about what's going on on their team. Um, and if, if you've got any of your team that are very judgmental around leaders, um, you should disqualify them from, from being involved in this. Judgmental, it just doesn't work in this environment. Um, Grant, have we got any other questions? I'm supposed to stop on nine, apologies. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, India has asked, uh, you said in the beginning that in the pod you are often coaching someone one-to-one -one while others watch on. Can you explain how this works? Yes, hi, Andy. How, do you, how are you doing? Thanks for the question. So, um, so typically what would happen is we'd deliver some content um, and then we would have, um, let's, let's say we're talking about change, for example, and then we'd have three participants in the, um, in the pod. So if I was the coach, I would uh, say to, you know, person A, okay, so, um, you know, how, how important is leading change in, in, on your team? Um, you know, how, I would ask a series of coaching questions about what's going on in relation to change in, in their team, in their environment, what are their responsibilities and so on. Um, and, you know, person A would, would, would answer. Um, usually we, do, we don't get all the way through the answer until person B says, oh, I have that problem too. But then we go to person B and say, what are your issues? And we'll go to person three, what are your issues? And then we come back to person one and say, right, so you've had a bit of time. So how do we solve these issues? You've got two or three people who are really open to change on your team, but two people who've been there a long time and refuse to change. How are we gonna manage that exercise? What does everybody think we should do for person A's two people? Um, and they, they group solve, um, and then we go to the person B, you know, what are you gonna do, you know, what problem have you got? So we go around, and then the final part of the pod is to say, okay, person A, what are you gonna do differently as a consequence of this coaching session? What are you gonna report back to us in a month's time when you come back into the session that you've done and tried and sorted? And, um, and person B, what are you gonna do a person? So we get these commitments out, they go away, a month later they come back and, um, and, they, and then typically what happens is they, well, the first conversation went really well, the second one was a train crash, and, and we, we, we talk about what we, we learned through that process. When we say that small group coaching is applied, that's what I mean. Like they've discussed stuff that they then are going to go and do, and that they then can come back and say, how did it go? Um, so that's really the key. Great question, India, thank you. Um, you want one more or do you want to go on? Sorry? You want one more question or do you want sure, to go? Sure. Okay, Yvette's asked, um, how do you go about communicating to people and culture people who don't make the cut so as to not break the relationship? Well, yes. Okay, so um, it's, the, it's the ultimate courageous conversation, right, Yvette? It's great, Paul. Um, uh, I, I think um, this is one of the reasons, and this, this is going to sound salesy, so I apologise, but this is why getting somebody external to, do, to train your coaches or accredit your coaches is probably a smart move because you can get them to do it. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I'm you know, reasonably, um, you know, happy. And we have, we've done it for a couple of clients where we've, we've gone back and said, this, this person aren't gonna make the grade. And if the, if the accreditation is done properly, they know that they are not making the grade, by the way, because they're crashing and burning in the pods because the accreditation is about them doing pods. Um, and, um, but I, I think if you establish upfront that um, we're only choosing the five or six or seven best people for this and it's all about the coaches and everyone is competing to get on the program. Um, that would be one way that I would, um, uh, you know, make sure you would do it. You might want to put, if, if somebody was really going to arc up, um, if it, you might want to give them a pod where you think the three participants are pretty good and will, will, will self train. Um, and then take a look at the, the data. So we've certainly accredited people that we thought would make the grade, and then we've looked at their data at the, uh, at the end, because we really assess coach effectiveness, as it, as it says actually on the slide that you're looking at now. Um, you know, is the coach turning up? Do they know what they're talking about? Are they asking lots of great coaching questions? Are they challenging me? Um, do, you know, th those are the sorts of things that we, we test. And someone who is very low on challenge um, we would we would usually exit from the program because they're not doing their job. Um, uh, so the manager perspective, you know, is the manager turning up? We, we measure everything here. So I think it's a difficult and courageous conversation, but um, this concept of making sure that people are not just putting their hands up, they have to actually be accredited and earn the right to do it. And there's very high standards. Um, I think that, that would be the way to do it. Okay, so 11, um, uh, how am I doing for time? Oh my God, um, create constantly flowing feedback. This is all um, uh, pretty obvious. You've had time to read this now while I've been rambling on. Um, the beauty about small group coaching is you can measure everything. Um, so um, uh, we regularly do, we do mid, mid, 
mid um, session uh, surveys and we do end of, end of se uh, session surveys as well. And the data is really, really quite interesting. It, 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 just to give you a sense, the net promoter score for uh, the coaches, for example, is you know up in the 50s and 60s. Very, very high net promoter score um, when you ask people, would you recommend you know, my fast lead coach to somebody else? Extraordin extraordinarily good. And that's across pretty much all of our coaches. Um, obviously, as per Yvette's question, if they're getting very low MPSs, then, then they don't get any more pots. Um, deliver on continuous improvement. Um, just jump to the bottom here and say that every good idea we've implemented has come from either participants, managers or clients. So I think that, you know, one of the things that people like, I think they tell us that they like about working with us is when we get feedback, we do something with it. Um, and I've never really, you know, worried about changing things that indicate we got it wrong the first time. You, you can't get anything right, exactly right the first time. So um, it does indicate that we're listening, learning, adapting, and, and, and quite often the participants just give us just great ideas as to how to improve things. So um, finally, we've got to avoid the post-program flop, by which I mean, wow, you've been invested in, you've been invested in, and you've got all these pod sessions, and you've got, you know, a learning portal, and um, there's all this exciting stuff going on for six or seven months and then radio silence, um, which we call a post-program flop. So um, it's worth planning right at the beginning what's next. You know, what post-program activities and engagements um, do you have? Well, one of the biggest issues with all frontline leadership training is that you do, you train them and then they don't, they, they literally feel invested in and then they stop being invested in and suddenly they get itchy feet and start leaving. And that's obviously not a good, not a good uh, look for any programs that you've been doing. So you want to avoid regretted churn as much as you possibly can. Um, we'd certainly put the graduates under the talent microscope, who's progressed, who hasn't. Um, and I think post program, the best way to think about it is experiences rather than programs. What other experiences can they be exposed to? In our checkout session with the three way checkout session with the manager, the coach and um, the participant, um, we plan a new personal growth plan for the six months post program. Um, so what are you going to be working on next? Um, and that, that seems to, you know, get things um, uh, going reasonably well. Um, and we also have an alumni program with uh, podcasts and uh, management challenges and all sorts of other stuff. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm, <clears throat> I'm worried that I've sound, made it sound you know, a lot of work and too complicated. It's just really a question of working through a process in the same way as you design anything else that you do. Um, the project management and the resourcing is really, I think, really critical. Um, you will get better results. Your participants absolutely adore it. Um, and quite often the pods hang, you know, hang in together post, um, post the program and still catch up and talk about issues. It's super flexible. Um, allows you to be really agile, which is kind of the message we all we all want to send to everybody upstairs at the moment. Um, and um, I'll go into a lot more detail, probably too much, um, in the uh, 13 tips, but you can, um, Grant will talk to you about what he's going to do with that in a moment. And um, and if you need some help, that's, that's great. Why don't I stop there, Grant, and see if anyone's still on the call. Great. No, no, uh, pretty much everyone's still on the call. Um, could I get you to put up the slide that had the original 13 tips? on it and then that will remind people uh, of, of sort of the topics we've covered today. Um, one question I've had privately is you said that managers never get the blame for nominating the wrong participants for the wrong reasons. How should that be changed? How should people change it to ensure they do get the blame or some kind of feedback? We'll, call it? <laughs> well I think the point is that if a manager is putting the wrong person on your program that's kind of your fault I guess. I think we have to take responsibility for it. So have we communicated really clearly what the criteria is? Have we put the participant through a process where they have to put their hand up and say, I want to be on the program? You know, a lot of, a lot of our programs, we ask people to do a video nomination now, you're just using their phone. And you very quickly figure out, you know, and you, you, the best way of dealing with it is to, is to promote the program so you're oversubscribed and then you can choose the 15 keenest. You know, that's the, that's the best way to do it. Um, but the managers need to be really clear that if they, particularly with small group coaching, you can involve the managers way more in small group coaching than you can in a typical workshop. And so, the, you know, they're, they're literally involved in every pod session, like having a conversation after each pod session. So I think making sure that the managers understand that they have responsibilities in this program as well. Um, 
most most of our clients report back to us they do get a double whammy effect because of the manager toolkits and things the, the managers and the participants are learning quite a bit as well and that's really helpful because quite often the reason you get that regretted churn is because somebody learns how to lead properly and then they come back and they look up at their manager and they go well I'm, you know he, he's not or she's not and that's where you get that churn so so involving the managers has a lot of a lot of advantages i think Okay. Um, Haranthi has asked, uh, I hope I've pronounced your name there correctly. Um, is there an overarching purpose to bring pods back to one large group and how would you do that? Uh, okay. Super question. Yeah. Um, uh, some of our clients do a group launch and actually the first of the topic um, is where all 15 or all, you know, 30 or 40 people are there together. There's some really good reasons for doing that. Um, uh, it enables you to get senior leaders in to talk to people. Um, you know, say how important the program is and, and so on and so forth. It enables you to get the managers along all in the same room as well. Um, and you can do exactly the same thing at the other end if, if, if that uh, works. You know, I strongly encourage it. I mean, just a, a half day or, or what have you. don't need to do uh, a, long, a long period. Or if people are flying in from everywhere, assuming we're allowed to fly ever again, um, then, you know, it's a way of doing it. Or, or you can do a group session with lots of pods using Zoom. I mean, I straight after this i've got a session with 30 people in south australia so um it's possible to you know particularly with breakout rooms now and what have you it's, it's really possible to run quite a good facilitated session you know virtually in, in fact i'd argue that in some areas it's better than people being in the room e.g strategic planning which is a session we've just recently done which we broke up into nine sessions rather than one day and everybody reported it was the best strategic planning session they'd ever been in, not because of us, but because of the way it was structured. So, but I think bringing people together at the beginning and, and having a graduation or something like that at the end. One of our clients in Melbourne, I hope they don't mind me mentioning them, Metro Trains um, had their CEO come along and hand out the graduation thing. The impact of that was just extraordinary. Um, really great on behalf of, of um, you know, the CEO and, um, and just sent all the right messages. So I think it's, it's great. A great suggestion. We don't do it on all of our programs, but um, uh, it's a very good idea. Okay, um, we've got a great question here from Julian, which I think is a bit thorny. Um, just before I start this, uh, if, if, sorry, the, the official sort of runtime for this is till quarter two. What we tend to do is have questions sort of from now until quarter two, um, and after quarter two, it's very much if people want to stay around, we'll keep the sort of question line open. But if you have questions, I strongly suggest you ask them now because we may not actually get to everything before we reach um, quarter two. So Julian's asked, um, I'm currently designing programs with zero coaching, i.e. 100% participant directed through pre-designed content. What should my design priorities be to maximize participant impact? Yeah, so it, it, is, a, it is a thorny question because um, very often um, the, the content needs to be brought to life. Um, by a facilitator or a coach or, or have you. And if you're, sounds Julian like you've got lots of constraints, um, you know, from a timing and a budget and what have you perspective. So, um, you know, trying to make self-paced stuff as interactive as possible in terms of making sure people watch a video, but then ask questions and, and they have an opportunity to submit their answers to the questions into somebody who can give them some feedback, those sorts of things you know, we've found work. Um, generally speaking, um, left to their own devices, uh, if people are really motivated, then, then they'll do it. And that's usually the top 10 to 20%. Um, if people aren't really motivated, bottom 20%, they, they won't do any of it. And um, so you're really designing for the people in the middle, I think. Um, very difficult, I think, just to give people content. We, have, we had a huge strategic conversation about LinkedIn learning in our business yesterday. Um, and... Um, you know, the engagement levels of our participants who, who have got, we've given LinkedIn licenses to and so on and so forth. And it's very, very challenging, self-paced, very challenging, unless someone's really ambitious and, and really wants to, to learn. Probably didn't answer that question very well, Grant, but um, that's as good as I've got. Okay, Julian, I mean, if you want to ask a follow-on question, we're right here. Um, Avet's asked, how do you balance involving a manager with maintaining confidentiality of what goes on in the pods? Yeah, great question. So we don't talk with the managers about what goes on in the pods at all, zero. What we do do with the managers and toolkits is to say, 
here are the concepts that they would have discussed in terms of, in, in other words, here was the curriculum they covered. Um, we don't have any sort of conversation with them about what was then discussed in that sort of 65% of the time. Um, for me, the toolkits are to try and make sure that the manager knows that the session has taken place, knows what the topic was, um, is, is encouraged to have a bit of a catch up, you know, Grant, how was that session you were in yesterday or the day before? Um, and also to avoid the goose factor. And um, what I mean by the goose factor is you don't want the, man the, the participant to know more about the topic than the manager because the manager then gets dismissive or defensive or whatever the case may be. So by making sure that they know what the change curve is and because there's eight, eight change stages, then you're creating an environment where the manager is um, able to sensibly have a conversation with their participant without looking like a goose. Um, uh, but we don't talk about what is actually discussed at all. We constantly get requests from HR to do that and, and we refuse all of them. And obviously we put that really clear up front. It's a great question, thank you. Um, in question three, you talked about making tactical decisions about the learning journey early. You've talked about this as an off the shelf program. What sort of options are, you know, what, what sort of options are available in terms of customizing? Yeah, so um, th these ones here, um, it's just a question of um, trying to figure out that the reason I say make them early is because it, they're very difficult to change later on. Um, so if you do one cycle, uh, to give you an example, um, uh, one of our clients decided that topic selection was going to be, topics were going to be selected by HR or L&D or OD. Um, and um, once you've made that decision, when you, when you have a cohort, they had quite a big cohort that people go through. Um, we can't change that halfway through, even though we've got lots of feedback halfway through in the halfway survey saying, hey, why can't we choose our topics? Um, or, you know, what idiot chose these topics for us? Um, they, it's too difficult to change at that time. Now, in the, the second um, iteration that, that client is doing, um, they're going to go three and three. So um, it's six cycles. So... Um, you know, the, the, the OD will choose three topics and then the participants will get three. So you can flex after the first delivery. It's very difficult to change things halfway through. Um, and um, so that's what I, I really meant about that. Okay, um, we have a question from Grace. Um, thank you for giving me your name as well. Um, where do you start if you're an organization that has no formal coaching program at the moment? <laughs> well, um, uh, Grace, at the beginning, um, the you know, I, I, what I would do, what we've attempted to do here is to share with you seven years experience and, um, uh, you know, who, who needs training and why, um, and particularly maybe who desperately needs um, leadership training right now um, in, the, in the middle of all this crisis, you know, who's, who's under a lot of pressure and would really benefit from the support that they would get with this scenario. Um, so you figure out who the cohort is, um, you figure out whether you're going to do it internally or you're going to do it externally. If you're starting absolutely from scratch, you might want to leverage um, an organization that has all the infrastructure already. Just do a couple of pilot pods uh, with an external supplier. Um, and then if they really work well, then you can, you can gradually build up the, um, and, and by you watching how they worked, um, you'll learn a lot about how to do it internally. Um, or, or you can simply start. <clears throat> um, the, the biggest thing is to get the curriculum sorted out. What, what are your eight or nine or 10 topics? Um, again, you can go on our website and see what we've done there. There's, there's actually lots of stuff you can steal really. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's where I would start. But I'd start with, you know, who, who, are the, who are the obvious target audience? Let's get a couple of pods underway. Um, let's le learn as we go along. Um, and um, and then gradually build the case for more and more as you go. I hope that answers your question properly, Grace. But and by the way, ha happy to have a chat with you if you if, offline if you if you if, if you want a bit more advice. Okay, um, Julian has asked, what do you put in a manager briefing pack? Um, <laughs> good question. I'll let you explain. Um, well, well, first rule: not too much, otherwise they won't read it. Um, so. Uh, which is in the process of redesigning these actually, Julian, um, because we think the ones that we have at the moment are a bit too intense. Um, but I would put, if we just use the example of um, <clears throat> change, maybe I'll use the example of managing up, OK? 
okay, which is one of our topics. Incidentally, managing up as a topic is never ever chosen by L and D and OD, and it's almost always chosen by the participants if they're given the opportunity. Interesting. Um, so in managing up, we talk we talk through from a curriculum basis around, you know, what what makes a really good relationship between a manager and a participant. What are the things that, um, you know, when we've seen that relationship work really well. Um, uh, what are those things and when it's not working well what are those things and how does the manager's style and the participant style how do they need to work together um, so that sort of content those questions we would put in the manager's guide um, so that the manager knows the sort of conversation that was had but they don't know what was said um, and um, uh, you know in particular in that case uh, you know, quite often the managers will will follow up and say so what did you say about me in the pod um, which is always an interesting conversation. So that would be the, um, that I think would be the, um, uh, what we put in. And, and then we put links to our learning portal. Um, you know, if you want more information about, you know, this or this or this, or you could, you know, you can watch this two minute video. Um, so if they want to follow up and know a bit more, um, that's it. And then some questions for them to ask their participants if they can't think of questions themselves, but short, sharp, and as simple as possible. I think that's my um, answer. Okay, great. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the inflexibility? <laughs> yes. Like, it's, I, I think that the, the question here is, we, we actually have a couple of questions left, but um, it's a sort of general question in a kind of inflexibility question mark. Yes, it, 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 the, I think the... Um, uh, well, 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 let me let me answer that question with a, with a story. So when we started off, we used to be really flexible. We used to change things at the last moment. Um, we used to put up with things and and it caused us an enormous headache at a project, project management level. Um, you know, Cheryl is probably on, on the call, you know, will be nodding in agreement. She's just had a nightmare with people changing all the time. And as soon as you allow people to change it once, then they think they've got permission to change every one of the six sessions. So in the end, we decided to go hardcore and go, right, we are not allowing you to change anything. And if you do change something, we're going to charge you a fortune for it. You know, there's a, a $300 charge for changing uh, a session. And there's this and there's that. And as soon as we went, and, and we also went much better in terms of managing the managers. So rather than telling the managers how draconian we were when they wanted to do something halfway through the program, we explained how draconian we were going to be up front and why. Um, because if things keep getting cancelled, the pod loses momentum. If, you know, six sessions over nine months, you just lose momentum. And you, you can see in the results that it's nowhere near as good a learning experience as it was for the ones that did the six along the way. So from our perspective, um, we, we got really draconian. And what happened when we got really draconian? Everybody started turning up on time, massively fewer um, changes. Um, as soon as we brought in the, the $300, all of a sudden people go, oh, oh, it's 300, oh, well, I'll, I'll turn up then. And they move to something else. So it's about establishing that this learning, if you send somebody on this program, they, on the second Tuesday of every month at 8 a.m., they need to be in this place for two hours. No, nothing is more important than that. That's, that's what you're committing to up front, both the participant and the manager. And you get them to sign that off in blood, and, um, and then you hold them to it. Um, and actually by being inflexible, you are creating a better learning environment for both the participant and the manager. Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions. We're now into the kind of optional part of the session. So we, we are starting to see people leave because people are booked in for 45 minutes. Um, if you have further questions, please ask them now because we're, we're kind of running down to the very last ones. Um, Wendy's asked, is there an evidence base HFL can share about the comparative benefit of coaching versus other learning methods? Um, uh, yes, so we ask a question in our exit survey. We ask people to ask, give us an assessment of how much they enjoyed small group coaching versus other training they've had. And I think, I can't remember exactly what the precise figure at the moment rolling is, but it's about, I think, 75% of participants, particularly for fast leader, frontline leader level, say it is the um, um, say it's the most effective, um, the most effective training they've ever had, um, and then they they list a whole pile of reasons why. Um, 
So we're in the process of collating all that data to put it out in a, um, in a white paper, but um, we actually have the real data and, and most people say it's the best training they've ever done. So great question, thank you. Okay, um, India has asked, are there certain topics that work better for small group coaching than other topics? Oh, what an interesting question. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> What we did at the beginning of our program with Fast Lead was we did a lot of research around what the most common challenges frontline leaders had, and then we built our curriculum around that. Absolutely not rocket science, I have to say. Um, so all of the topics, when you look at the topics, you, any any experienced um, leadership developer would, would look at it and go, yeah, of course, they're the topics. So I don't think so. I think um, there's some skill in making sure that the design inside that part of the curriculum is done in a particular way. So, um, uh, but I, no, I don't think so, India. I think we, we, we certainly don't have data and we look at this all the time that suggests that um, some topics are far less effective in pods than others. They all, they all seem to be pretty much um, enjoyed similarly. Okay, I think we're actually running to the end of the questions now. Does anybody have anything else they want to ask? Or Alistair, actually, I'll throw one open to you. Is there one question you think people should have asked? Excuse me, that's but, my question. You can't throw that question at me. Um, uh, no, no, I don't think so. I think the, I mean, the question's been great because they've pulled out things that um, I might not have mentioned. There's probably quite a few more, there's a lot more detail in the document if you're interested in that. Um, uh, but I, I think that the central one is, you know, making sure the number one success factor is figuring out who your coaches are going to be. And if they're internal, making sure they're properly accredited, I think. Um, because at the end of the day, what the coach does in the pod overcomes everything else. Um, you can have the best project management you like, but if the coach isn't up to it, um, then the learning doesn't occur. Uh, and if the coach isn't challenging enough, um, then, you know, people don't deploy, um, so I think the coach piece is critical. 